Hello and welcome to another weekly true crime live stream. If you're new here, hi, I'm Fiersona, you can call me Sona, and I'm your friendly neighborhood true crime VTuber, here to give you full body chills, here with another terrifying true crime case. Okay, you guys, what is going on in the chat? Because I'm just seeing, I'm just seeing things and, um, Kronos, what is going on? <laughs> what, what happened? But also, happy Easter. Uh, yep, so, I mean, you saw the thumbnail, you saw the title of this video, and it's gonna be, uh, it was supposed to be, okay, it was supposed to be a cryptid files case this week, but I've changed my mind and I've decided to uh, cover this true crime case because I just, like, literally came across the uh the video and and it's it's kind of <clears throat> all right you guys happy easter uh here's my gift to you so if you are having a great day which i hope you did i'm about to ruin it for you okay without further ado uh also thank you so much to you know before we begin this video thank you so much to all of my patreon members because you guys keep this channel alive thank you so much to all of my patreon members who showed up uh for you know for the stream yesterday we had a full body chill stream we did read i did read some uh scary stories from reddit scary scary reddit posts and there was a headless jogger there was a haunted train there was a in an invisible entity that was speaking to the op it was pretty um blood chilling so so yeah if you're if you're interested if you're curious what stories we were reading yesterday, uh, you can just go to my Patreon and, and yeah, like if you join, you can have access to those bonus streams. Okay, that's it. That's it. You guys, are you ready? Are you ready? Because today we're talking about an unusual case of a 10 year old serial killer. Well, 10, 11, because it just so happens that she, like, it happened, everything was, like, kind of taking place in the year where she turned, when she turned 11. So, this girl became the youngest known serial killer in the UK. On the 11th of May, 197, no, oh, sorry, it's not 1978, 1968, great job, great job. Here at the beginning, um, you miss, you just kind of mispronounce things. Great. Okay, so on the 11th of May 1968, a distressing incident unfolded when a wandering, injured three year old boy was found near St. Margaret's Road in Scotswood. Uh, this is Scotswood, it's kind of near Newcastle, so this is the area of England. Um, the boy tells the police that he'd been playing atop an air raid shelter with two of his friends. 10-year-old Mary Flora Bell and 13-year-old Norma Joyce Bell when he suddenly like he said he was suddenly pushed forcefully pushed from the shelter's roof falling seven feet which is 2.1 meters to the ground and suffering a severe head laceration so the boy was sure he didn't just slip and fall accidentally he was very like even though he was three he says no someone pushed me um you know he was insistent that someone had pushed him either mary on or norma but he wasn't actually able to tell the police which of the girls was the culprit he didn't know he was just you know certain that hey it was just the three of us and someone pushed me that very evening Police receive a disturbing complaint from the parents of three young girls living in the same neighborhood as Mary and Norma Bell. Uh, by the way, Mary and Norma are not related. Uh, they are just neighbors and it just completely co coincidentally, uh, they have the same uh, surname, but they are not related by blood. The parents, so, you know, this call, this distress report uh, to the police says that three young girls uh, that were living in the same neighborhood as Mary and Norma were playing with the two girls, with Mary and Norma, and um, apparently the girls, these two girls made, um, or one of them, made a disturbing attempt to strangle their children while they were innocent playing, innocently playing in a sandpit. 
uh, officers immediately respond to these, you know, the, these two incidents and make their way to the homes of Mary and Norma uh, to question both of the girls, right? Mind you, despite, you know, um, never mind. Okay, I just, I was going I was gonna talk about the last name, but um, actually it doesn't really matter. But yeah, like they are not blood related, right? Like they are just neighbors, uh, and they've been, you know, Norma and, and Mary, they've been hanging out um, a lot lately, um, pretty much like ever since they were born, and. And yeah, like they, despite like sharing the same name, they, they're not related. They're just neighbors. It just, it was just a huge coincidence. Okay. So police arrive and during these interviews, right? Like with Mary and, and Norma, both girls denied any responsibility for the incident at the air raid shelter, uh, asserting that they had only stumbled upon the injured boy who was already bleeding profusely from his head and they had nothing to do with his injury or or the fall when pressed about the other incident uh with the you know the three young girls in the sand pit mary denied any involvement and said that she didn't know anything about this incident but norma on the other hand confessed that mary had made some unsettling remarks and action actions sorry actions so this is what Norma told the police. Mary, quote, Mary went to one of the girls and said, what happens if you choke someone? Do they die? Do they die? No, no, they just fall asleep. Um, so what happens when you choke someone? Do they die? Then Mary put both hands round the girl's throat and squeezed. The girl started to go purple. I told Mary to stop, but she wouldn't. Then she put her hands around Pauline's throat and she started going purple as well. Another girl, Susan Cornish, came up and Mary did the same thing to her. End quote. A lovely child. Clearly, very well behaved, very uh, curious girl. Uh, she's just curious if someone dies if you choke them. Surprise, surprise, they do if you do it hard enough and long enough. Okay, so obviously officers are in shock. Um, they promptly informed the local authority about, you know, the incidents and, uh, and the Mary's concerning behavior, uh, like their supervisors, right? However, because of their young age of just 13 and 10, right? Like Mary is 10, Norma is 13. Both girls were issued just a warning and no further legal, legal action was pursued. Big mistake number one. This is just the first one. And then on May 25th, 1968, so this is, you know, this is a couple of days later, a couple of weeks later, right? Like this happens in May 1968. On May 25th, 1968, um, the body of a four-year-old boy named Martin Brown was discovered inside an upstairs bedroom of a, um, of a house, like a, der I don't, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, derelict, der derelict, I think, derelict house. Uh, so basically a house that was supposed to be demolished soon. Um, it was like this whole project. I'm gonna explain it later, but uh, but yeah, you know, this house was supposed to be demolished soon, but um, they, there was still a family living there that were they were supposed to be relocated by the government, the, the local government, to another housing, uh, while their old house, kind of Victorian era house, was uh, going to be demolished. Right. So this four-year-old boy. Um, <laughs> sorry, I just looked at the chat. Is this real? Yeah, it's a real case. It's a legitimate case. And you will not believe how it ends. Uh, okay, so this boy, four-year-old Martin Brown, uh, was discovered inside an upstairs bedroom of his house at 85 St. Mar Margaret's Road. So again, in Mary's neighborhood. So the grim discovery of Brown's body was made by uh, two, I think, okay, so here it's not exactly clear. Some reports say like, oh, by three children. Uh, some say but by two children, just two boys, uh, local boys, at 3.30 p.m., right? Like he's discovered and he was found lying on his back with his arms extended above his head, despite the presence of uh, specks of blood and foam near his mouth uh, there were no outward signs of violence on his body uh, upon arrival at the scene local workman john hall attempted cpr but it was already too late like little martin was 
long gone. Uh, just as John began the CPR, two more children appear at the nursery's doorway. Can you guess who? So Mary Bell and Norma Bell appear in the house. Uh, John just thinks that, hey, you know, like, kids are curious, whatever, get out of here, you shouldn't be, you know, he shoes them away out of the house, saying that kids shouldn't be looking at these horrible scenes, right? Kids shouldn't be seeing this. But this is not why they came there, like, here, you'll find out later. Uh, so, Mary and Norma, you know, John shoes them away, shoes them out of the house, pushes them out of the house, he doesn't want them to see uh, the dead body of uh, Martin's dead body, right? But Mary and Norma don't go home, instead, they knock on the door of Martin's aunt. And when the woman opened, Mary, very like in a very confident voice, and like as a matter of fact, uh, he just states to her, like it gives her the disturbing news. And this is what she said quote, One of your sister's bar barns, barons, I guess, barons, uh, had just had an accident. We think it's Martin, but we can't tell because there's blood all over him. End quote lovely child again <laughs> oh my god it's a demon i'm i'm sorry for freaking out already but like because i know this whole case i can tell you right now demon child oh my god it's a demon okay so you know police again arrive at the scene uh because but they are puzzled because apart from traces of blood and you know a little bit of saliva on the victim's face there were no other signs of violence, and investigators did discover an empty bottle of painkillers lying on the floor somewhere near the body, which then prompted them to think that Martin may have just accidentally ingested the pills, uh, which led to his death. An unfortunate accident. And uh, the following day, Bernard Knight, uh, who was a coroner, he conducted a post-mortem examination on Martin's body and he again found no evidence signs of foul play that could determine the boy's death consequently martin's death was classified as accidental big mistake number two uh, then on may 26 so the day after martin's brown Mar martin brown's uh, death and on the exact day of mary bell's 11th birthday someone broke into and vandalized a nursery located in nearby Woodland Crescent. So the perpetrators gained entry to the premises by removing tiles from the slate roof. Uh, once inside, they basically overturned desk, tore some books and smeared ink and paint everywhere before escaping the scene. Upon discovering the break-in, and this is an important Part of this case. So when the break-in was discovered and, you know, like all the vandalism uh, was discovered the following day, staff at the nursery immediately informed the police. And during their investigation, authorities found four separate notes claiming responsibility for Martin Brown's murder. And this is what the note says. Like, this is what the notes say. One of them stated, quote, I murder so that I may come back. Well, another read, we did murder Ma Martin Brown. Fuck off, you bastard. And another one, fuck off, we murder. Watch out, Fanny and Faggot. And then another one, the most elaborate, it declared, quote, you are mice. Why? Because we murdered Martin. Go, Martin, go Brown. You beat, look out there. There are murders about by Fanny and old faggot and you screws. I have no idea what it said. Like, yeah, it it kind of it's I mean, clearly very weird note, very strange word. This was a quote, by the way. But yeah, very strange note. Um, you can't make sense of it, but it is clear that it is still about Martin Brown and it is still about murder and it is still like saying that, hey, we're going to murder again. Uh, but, however, despite the fact that, you know, these notes were clearly very disturbing and it had something to do with uh, Martin Brown's death, uh, the police dismissed all the notes and this incident, the vandalism, um, as just 
you know, someone was playing a prank. Um, and by the way, even when several nights after this break in, Mary Bell and Norma Bell were caught just loitering outside the school, the same school where the, the school that was vandalized, police arrived and they, you know, they caught them, but then they let them go oh, again, thinking that, hey, it's just stupid kids just playing a prank, which is a big mistake, number three. Okay. And then they dismissed them. Yep. Yeah, well, dismissed the notes, and then they actually found Mary and Norma just kind of, you know, walking around the same nursery and just kind of being suspicious, and they let them go. They just, they were just like, oh no, stupid kids, playing pranks, whatever. I am so confused. Not, you're not the only one. I'm, I was super confused when I, when I read this. Okay. Then on May 29th, it's the same month, May, May 1968. May 29th, the day of Martin's funeral, uh, Mary Bell actually shows up at Martin's house. And when Martin's grieving mother, June Brown, opened the door, Mary asked to see Martin, which, you know, made Martin's mom think that the sad news about her son's death hadn't reached little Mary yet. And she was just like, oh my God, poor child. I have to tell her that, you know, my son is dead and her friend is dead. So she kindly informed Mary that Martin had, had passed away. And here's the creepy part, because Mary, to this, Mary responds, quote, Oh, I know he's dead. I want to see him in his coffin. Take that in. Take it. See my child. Okay, so Martin's mother, obviously in shock, She's horrified by this request and he, she immediately shuts the door in Mary's face because like, what the actual fuck? And then in the days and weeks after Martin's funeral and uh, unknowingly to any of the adults, Mary Bell started spreading the word about, um, you know, among her classmates that and friends or kids in the neighborhood, actually, like you can't, I can't even call them her friends because she didn't really have friends. Uh, but yeah, like she started spreading the word among her neighbors like the neighborhood kids that she was responsible for martin's death however due to the her reputation as this like boastful and untrustworthy uh kid you know her claims were dismissed by many like no one really believed her big mistake number four um that is until another young boy was discovered dead on the afternoon of July 31st, this is a couple of months later, July 31st, 1968, three-year-old Brian Howe was playing outside his residence with one of his siblings, their family dog, and Mary Bell and Norma Bell. Well, shit, what could go wrong? So as the afternoon progressed, Brian failed to return home. This is actually the time, you know, like you might, you might say this is fucking crazy. Like this is a three-year-old boy. Why, what is he doing outside alone just with kids, with a dog? Like why, why is he out and about? But this is the time, you know, it is 68, like 60s. It's the time where, you know, everyone thought like, oh, it's, it's safe for the kids to just play outside. Like there's nothing in the neighborhood. There's nothing to worry about. Right. But um, it was a different time. Yes, it was a different time. There was just like different, um, you know, different mindset, different, uh, yeah, like it was, well, I mean, was it safer? Not really. Like it was the time of like freaking serial killers. Uh, but you know, people just thought differently. They thought like, oh, everyone is looking out for each other. No one's going to ignore a child. You know, like if something's happening, someone's going to help nowadays. Eh. Okay. Anyway, so Brian is playing outside, uh, with his sibling, the family dog, and Mary and Norma Bell. Um, but as, you know, they gave... They, that big, big <laughs> I'm sorry, I slapped myself. I meant the day, not the day. <laughs> I mean, oh God, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Um, but... <laughs> oh God, good job, good job, fear. Good job, fear, scuff counter, so many. <laughs> <laughs> so many the list goes on ah. oh, okay 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 let me just stop laughing because uh because this is this is not a case to laugh about but 
yeah, like the me, me just like fumbling over my words. Uh, that's that's to you know something to laugh about. Uh, and then rabbit, hi, hi, hello to everyone. Thank you so much. By the way, thank you so thank you so much to all of my mods. Oh yeah, it's April first, isn't it? April Fools. Well, to me, for me, it's April Fools. I don't know if uh, if it is for you guys. Um, so forgot completely forgot uh but yeah okay thank you so much for my mods to my mods for uh modding the stream please you guys don't give them to you know like a uh, hard time uh just let everyone enjoy the stream abide by the rules anyway all right back to the case so you know the day progressed and brian fails to return home uh which obviously worries his relatives the neighbors and uh, everyone starts uh, searching for him everyone starts scouring the streets in you know to, in search for him uh, but unsuccessfully it wasn't until 11 p.m 11 10 p.m that a search party stumbled stumbled upon brian's lifeless body uh, wedged between two concrete blocks near the area known as tin lizzie so tin lizzie i'm just gonna like Oh, this is actually the crime scene, by the way. Uh, and that X in this picture, this is where Martin... Well, not Martin. Brian's body was uh, was found. Uh, so, the area of Tin Lizzie... Um, like, Tin Lizzie was essentially this large expanse of waste ground uh, with rubble near the railway uh, line, which is like the rubble from those uh, derelict houses, right? Like, so those... Th those are the areas after the demolition of those houses, the old houses, Victorian era um, buildings. And many such places were left in the area as part of the urban renewal project. Essentially, the local government started to, uh, you know, demolish the old Victorian era uh, slums uh, to build modern housing. And and so Tin Lizzy was, um, you know, was called like the it was that area that was like after the demolition. OK. Uh, so this is actually the crime scene and this is where, you know, Brian's body was found. Uh, so the boy's body was covered in clumps of grass and weeds, uh, which the first officer who arrived at the scene described as a, quote, deliberate but feeble, end quote, attempt to hide it. So someone was, you know, someone who killed him deliberately, deliberately wanted to hide the body. Uh, he also noted that Brian's lips had turned uh, bluish purple, uh, which is a process called uh, cyanosis, uh, which takes place due to a decrease in the oxygen saturation of uh, hemoglobin within the red blood cells in the uh, capillary network. So essentially, someone strangled him. Uh, not only that, the boy also had multiple bruises and scratches to his neck. So again, someone strangled him. Uh, there was also a pair of broken scissors next to his feet, which later turned out to have been used to mutilate Brian's body because, as it turns out, that he had like multiple uh, scratches, stab wounds, puncture wounds uh, to his legs, to his body. So the coroner determined that Brian had indeed died of str strangulation and uh, had been deceased for about uh, seven and a half hours before anyone found his body. Uh, as for the scissors, you know, the perpetrator used them to, and, you know, like, if you don't like, if you're, if you can't really handle graphic description and graphic details, uh, you better, like, I advise you not to listen to this because it's pretty gruesome. Okay, so, uh, the perpetrator actually used those broken scissors to inflict puncture wounds to Brian's legs, uh, cut off sections of his hair, mutilate his genitalia, and carved the initial M into the boy's stomach. Gee, I wonder who, what, what the M stands for. <sighs> demon child. Not Brian, the demon. Okay, so the most startling revelation from the coroner's report was the minimal force employed in the murder, which led the coroner to suspect that the perpetrator was not an adult, but rather another child. Crazy. I think this is a crazy discovery, you know? Like you, yeah, in these cases, if you're the coroner, if you're the investigator, the detective, you would never jump to, you. like this is not your first conclusion. This is not your first, uh, you know, the 
right? Like your your first conclusion, like oh, this was someone like this is a child serial killer. This is this was done by a child, right? Like you, the first thing you jump to is okay. Well, the perpetrator is an adult and they hurt a child. No, this corner is just like holy shit. This was done by another kid. <sighs> so. Coroner also found gray and maroon fibers on uh, Brian's clothing and shoes. These actually did not match any of the items or clothing belonging to Brian's family, which means they had to come from the killer. Uh, Brian's how Brian House murder sent shockwaves through the entire community. Uh, the response from the law enforcement and from the local residents was was huge. Everyone wanted the perpetrator to be quickly found and arrested. Uh, because until then, none of the children were safe, right? You can't just... Because it's a, it's a child. Well, I mean, I don't even know if uh, police actually revealed that it's a child. But everyone was scared anyway, because this is the second uh, mysterious death of a child in the area, right? Uh, so more than 100 detectives... This is again a picture from the crime scene. Uh, more than 100 detectives from various departments in, uh, in, you know, in the area were mobilized uh, for the investigation. By August 2nd, over 1,200 children had been interviewed regarding their whereabouts on the day of the murder. So they were now... Everyone knows, hey, why are you, you know, interviewing all those children? Why are you not investigating adults? But no, it seems like, well, I mean, you know, because the murderer was a child. Uh, all I want to understand is why someone would do this. This is so sick. Well, I mean, I shall explain. Uh, this is gonna be explained and you will not be happy with this explanation. And it's gonna be, it's not gonna get any better. Like, that's what I can tell you. It will just get worse and worse. Um, sticking around since I really want to know what they did to those demon children. Well, yeah, like you have to... You know, you have to listen to uh, the last, the, the, the whole story, right? Uh, you have to listen to the case till the end. Okay, so the first ones questioned on August 1st and were Mary Bell and Norma Bell because of the fact that they were possibly the last ones seen with Brian shortly before his death. Uh, the interview instantly set off some red flags because Norma appeared kind of enthusiastic for some reason. And she really, like, she was fidgeting, she really wanted to say something, but, but didn't, right? Like, she didn't. She was kind of like, it seemed like she was limiting herself, but she was, like, super excited to, um, to talk. Mary, on the other hand, she was reserved, she didn't talk much, and she was very observant, you know? Like, she was just kind of, I don't know, like, she, it gave, it gave the investigators the creeps, uh, but she was kind of, like, more quiet and reserved. Uh, although both girls initially provided vague and conflicting statements, they confessed to having played with Brian on the day of his death, but denied encountering him after lunchtime. So she, they were just like, no, we have nothing to do with, you know, what happened to him. He was alive when, you know, we were playing with him, but then, then we left, so, and he was okay. The next day, uh, when Mary was questioned again, she suddenly, uh, quote-unquote, remembered uh, seeing an eight-year-old boy playing with Brian, the local boy playing with Brian that afternoon before he, his disappearance. She said that she saw the boy hitting Brian at one point, which, I mean, a bunch of bull crap, but okay. Uh, she said the unnamed boy was uh, covered in weeds and grass and was carrying a pair of scissors, which Mary said he tried to use to cut uh, a cat's tail off. Uh, she then added, quote, but there was something wrong with them. One leg was broken or bent. End quote. This is regarding the scissors. And this was a huge red flag. You know why? Because aside from the police, no one else knew that the scissors were broken. This was not an information. This was not disclosed to the public. So the only one that could have known that the scissors were broken was the perpetrator. Then, on August 4th, Norma Bell's parents reached out to the police saying that Norma changed her mind and decided to confess and disclose everything she knew regarding the death of Brian Howe. Lo and behold, um, Norma confessed that Mary Bell was behind the murder, that she had led Norma to uh, a, quote, spot on the Tin Lizzie, end quote, uh, where she then showed her the already deceased Brian. 
Mary then demonstra demonstrated to Norma how exactly uh, had she strangled and mutilated Brian's body. Uh, she even mentioned to Norma that she greatly enjoyed doing so and said that she wanted to commemorate this moment by carving her initials into Brian's body. So that's why the M on his stomach, right? Turns out that uh, she did so not only with the broken razor, like, sorry, with the broken scissors, but also with a razor blade. Uh, a razor blade which wasn't found at the time. And then, you know, Mary hid uh, the razor somewhere at the crime scene. And Norma actually told the investigators where the, the blade was hidden. And the, then they found it. So it was, you know, it was true. Uh, Norma even drew a picture of the placement of all the wounds on Brian Howe and it matched perfectly with the coroner's report. So there's no way that, you know, she, she, she didn't see the body. Uh, so in the early hours of August 5th, Mary Bell was visit visited at her residence by the police and she quickly got defensive uh, when questioned about all the inconsistencies in her earlier statements, denied everything and even told the detectives, quote, you're trying to brainwash me. I will get a solicitor to get me out of this, end quote. This is said by an 11 year old child. It's crazy. Ugh. Crazy, absolutely crazy. Stephen Child. Uh, mind you, that same day, Norma was questioned again and she actually confessed that confessed that it wasn't just that Mary showed her Brian's body. Norma was there when Mary attacked and strangled Brian. At one point, Norma said, um, Mary turned to her and stated, quote, quote, sorry, quote, my hands are getting, my, get, my hands are getting thick, take over, end quote. <laughs> she quite literally wanted Norma to take over and help her murder Brian. Um, at this point, Norma got scared and ran away from the scene. This is what she confessed, like, oh, you know, like I, this, this was the, this was the quote, my hands are getting thick, take over. Uh, so yeah, Norma, after this line, she got freaked out, uh, she ran away, right? And you know what's really fucked up? Because this is not, I mean, if you didn't think that all of this was fucked up, uh, there's another, another thing, one more thing. So, on the day of Brian's death, um, he, after he was already dead, when his sister was searching for him, Mary and Norma volunteered to help with the search. And as they were coming through the neighborhood together and in the area of Tin Lizzy, uh, at one point, Mary like casually mentioned the two concrete blocks, the same ones were, that were concealing Brian's body. But, but Norma quickly like expressed doubt, suggesting that Brian wouldn't be found there. And as a result, Brian's sister moved on and continued her search elsewhere without checking the blocks. So maybe this was like right after the murder, apparently. So maybe there was a chance that he would be alive had the sister found him earlier, but because it took so long, he just, yeah, he, he passed away. Uh, so upon this revelation, another forensic examination revealed that the gray and maroon fibers, you know, the ones that were found on Brian's body, uh, were an exact match to a woolen dress owned by Mary and then a skirt worn by Norma. So the gray ones were the gray, fiber, gray fibers belonged to Mary, and then the maroon ones was were from the skirt that Norma was wearing. Moreover, uh, those same gray fibers from Mary's dress were also found on Martin Brown, the four-year-old boy whose death was pre previously ruled as accidental, so it wasn't an accident, now they knew. Uh, both girls were charged with the murder of Brian Howe at 8 p.m. on August 7th, 7th uh, 1968 uh, while Norma cried you know she was terrified and she cried because of it Mary on the other hand she seemed completely fine and she just stated that's all right by me <sighs> demon child that's it's the devil the devil with the evil within okay so this is not this is not the end you guys we're just like halfway halfway there um but uh yeah there's this is not you know the end of disturbing facts about this story and there here's here's another one here's another one wait 
halfway. Yeah, Kai. Well, I mean, okay, okay, okay. We are 60% done with the case. 60% is covered. It gets worse. Well, I mean... It does, well, I mean, okay, okay, okay. So... Yeah, it gets worse. It gets worse. What do you mean? How is it not the end? No, it's not the end. This is not the end. Okay, so... Uh, Brian's funeral took place earlier during the day, so on the day when uh, Mary and Norma were arrested, right? Uh, but according to Detective Dobson, uh, that was who was present at the scene, he was on the case and he was present at the scene where, you know, like, um, just kind of for, you know, there he was there for Brian's funeral and he was just kind of, he was just scouting Mary's house, he was just making sure that she's not gonna run away. Um, so according to Detective Dobson, Mary Bell was seen standing outside of Brian's house, observing the coffin as it was brought home. And Dobson said that the girl, uh, quote, st this is actually the neighborhood. Um, so Dobson said that the girl, quote, stood there laughing, laughing and rubbing her hands. I thought, my God, I've got to bring her in. She'll do another one. End quote. Demon child. Demon child. Holy shit. Okay, so after her arrest, uh, Mary composed a written statement in which she confessed to being present during Brian's murder, but blamed the murder itself on Norma. She said that Norma was the one that strangled him. Norma was the, the one responsible for both de deaths, right? Like, for both boys. Uh, she also admitted to breaking into the Woodland Crescent Nursery that day, uh, the day following Martin Brown's killing, and vandalizing the premises and writing the four creepy notes. Uh, so shortly after this confession, both girls underwent, underwent a psychological evaluation. Uh, it revealed that Norma Bell uh, was intellectually de delayed and thus also easily manipulated and submissive. Like, Norma was 13, but she kind of had the intellectual capacity of an 8-year-old, apparently. Uh, this was, like, the diagnosis. Mary. Mary, on the other hand, she was highly intelligent. She was manipulative, cunning, and prone to sudden mood swings. Four different psychiatrists evaluated Mary, and they diagnosed her with a psychopathic personality disorder. She was a, a psychopath. So before we get to the legal proceedings, we have to look at Mary's background because experts believe that her upbringing and environment contributed greatly to um, her psychopathic behavior later on. And it's just like, it uh, it kind of amplified it, right? Like Because people get diagnosed with the psychopathic personality disorder every day. There's you know, there's many people out there with this disorder. Does it mean that all of them are serial killers? No. So the experts think that, hey, her background, what she's gone through in her childhood greatly contributed to her, uh, you know, desire to kill. And I'm going to explain why. So Mary's mother was a 16 year old local prostitute by the name Elizabeth Betty McCricket. And when Mary was born, Betty allegedly... Also, mind you, this picture is just... I mean, I okay, it was... I think this picture is uh, was enhanced, um, like, because it was... Uh, there's some older pictures, but this was enhanced, but it still looks fucking creepy. So creepy. Anyway, so... So, uh, it does... Oh, it does get worse. Oh, it does get worse. Absolutely. It does get... It gets so much worse. Uh, so... Mary's mother was a prostitute named Betty McCricket, and when Mary Mary was born, uh, Betty allegedly told the doctors that, uh, you know, she she said, "quote Take that thing away from me." End quote. Um, she didn't even want to look at baby Mary, uh, even though she didn't abandon. Which I don't kind of understand. Like this is this is the part I really don't get because why uh but like okay so she didn't abandon mary at the hospital and she did take her home uh but betty was far from being a loving mother uh she was absent most of the time traveling to different towns quote unquote for work uh so she would simply leave her children at home there was like i i think mary had an older sister uh so she would 
leave her children at home either in the care of their father, which who likely was not Mary's biological father, uh, or alone, basically to fend for themselves. Like a little, little infant and maybe like a couple of years, like, you know, a toddler or whatever. Uh, so the father figure present in Mary's life was William Bill Bell, uh, who was a raging alcoholic and with violent tendencies, who was also a convic convicted criminal with a record of violent armed robberies. As a baby and a toddler, Mary suffered various injuries in multiple quote-unquote household accidents. Uh, coincidentally, almost always, those accident, almost, ac accidents almost always happened when Mary was alone with her mother. Uh, some believe that Betty was trying to harm or kill Mary. Crazy. And it gets worse. Yes, it, ge it, can, it can get worse. It does. Uh, cześć, Sona, hi! <laughs> why, why, why? Siema, siema, jak, jak leci? Jak tam leci dzień? I, I don't know, I, I sound weird. Wie, wiem, że jakoś dziwnie, dziwnie brzmi po polsku, jak... Okay. If I'm talking in English, I can't switch to Polish. <laughs> uh, but hi. Okay, so, um, you know, coincidentally, uh, some believe that, again, like, Betty was trying to kill Mary. Um, there was this incident in uh, 1960 when Betty uh, accidentally, quote unquote, dropped baby Mary from a first floor window, uh, which is great, you know, mother of the year. Uh, then on another occasion, she fed her daughter sleeping pills, also apparently accidentally. I don't know how, but yeah. Uh, and then on another occasion, she literally sold Mary off to a mentally disturbed woman who uh, wanted a child, but she couldn't adopt and she couldn't conceive. Uh, so she just literally gave the baby away. And at that time, Mary's older sister, Catherine, uh, took it upon herself to travel alone, uh, like to another town to get Mary back. And the crazy part is that Betty, Betty's relatives, it's not like no one offered to take the kids in, to take Mary in. Because clearly, like, she hated Mary. She didn't want her. So, you know, her family, Betty's family, offered to take Mary in. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna adopt her. They're gonna raise her. You don't have to worry, you know, like, we're gonna take her from you, right? Uh, on multiple occasions, they offered. And Betty would just refuse every single time. Like, she just didn't want to give her away but then didn't want to take care of her. So like, what the fuck is your problem, lady? Like, what do you want? Um, you know, she did not care about little Mary. Uh, she didn't want her, but at the same time, like she didn't want to give her away. So who the fuck knows? Uh, there are also, and it gets worse. <laughs> I hate that I have to tell, like say this, but yes, it gets worse. Uh, so there are allegations that Mary's mother was a dominatrix. Uh, which is a woman taking dominant role in uh, like BDSM activities. And she apparently allowed some of her clients to sexually abuse Mary in sadomasochistic uh, sessions when Mary was just a toddler, like as young as like three or something. Crazy. Um, these may, oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's why, I, that's why I told you guys it gets so much worse. Um, mother of the year, everyone. Uh, that is fucked up. That is, that is really fucked up. Like, I know, you know, the way she turned out, obviously not great. Mary just became this, and this, yeah, like serial killer. But then this is what was happening in her childhood. Um, so these may explain uh, Mary's later violent behavior towards other children. Uh, that's what I said, right? Like, oh, she had... Yes, she was diagnosed with, like, psychopathic personality disorder, but, like, when, where did she learn those violent behaviors? She learned them because of what she's gone through. So, you know, this explains the violent behaviors. There was one incident. This is, like, another... Um, incident where when Mary was younger uh, there was this one incident where Mary tried to block her classmates uh, throat with sand she essentially like was just like forcing sand down someone's throat 
uh, ever since then other ch children at school and in the neighborhood like they didn't want to socialize with Mary and the only one by her side was Norma Bell like they just kind of became friends and and they were hanging out together but that's also because uh, that's like apparently also because Norma was like very submissive and she was just kind of like going with everything that Mary was doing uh <clears throat> crazy I mean absolutely crazy uh, so the trial took place on December 5th, uh, 1968, and both girls pleaded not guilty in front of the judge. Uh, on the very very first day of the trial, the judge uh, waived both defendants' right to anonymity on account of their age, uh, which essentially meant that the media um, and reporters, everyone could reveal their names, uh, their ages, and photos to the public. Uh, during the trial, the prosecutor informed the court that Mary Bell's motive for the murders was, quote, solely for the pleasure and excitement of killing, end quote. Uh, concurrently, the British media labeled her as evil born. Uh, Norma, on the other hand, Norma, Norma, like, just kind of kept denying any uh, direct role in the murder of either of the boys. Uh, but she admitted in front of the judge that she knew of Mary's tendency for violence and uh, she knew of her history of attacking children in the neighborhood. Uh, she also said that prior to the murders, uh, Mary casually mentioned that she wanted to kill someone to try to kill one of the children, one of the small children. And, you know, she said like, oh, she was curious how it felt. Um, Norma also admitted that she was so paralyzed with fear uh, of going against Mary that when Brian Howe was being strangled, she failed to, you know, like scream for help. She fa failed to alert other children or adults, um, you know, um, that were in the proximity of, of this area, Tin Lizzie. Uh, she said, she said this, quote, I did not know what was going to happen in the first place. She had stopped hurting him for a bit when the boys were near, uh, near the concrete blocks, end quote. So Mary denied these claims. Um, she even started crying in a policewoman's arm, arms, which, like, before you know her, he, her history, her childhood, you're just like, I, like, before I knew the background, I was just like, oh, boo-hoo, like, cry me a river, like, just, you know, little psycho, but... <laughs> But now that I know, like, after knowing the, the background, it's just like, I don't see, like, she did kill two children and she was a little psycho. At the same time, she did go through some pretty fucked up stuff and that just made her into this monster. Um, so am I, am I wrong to, for feeling bad? Like, am I, am I, like, fucked up? Like, am I messed up? Or feeling bad for her too because like in part I do feel bad for Mary like for what her mother did to her what the those like you know the clients did to her like how she was abused and like what how that shaped her am I like is is there something wrong with me for like feeling bad for her uh, even like despite the fact that she killed those children and she was violent I don't feel I don't feel bad she killed a three-year-old yeah like the obviously that was wrong and obviously like she was you know, that was an evil thing to do, but at the same time, like, I, you know, I find myself just feeling bad for her, too. Um, no, you aren't. You just uh, have empathy for her. Don't worry. Yeah, like, so that's, yeah, I think that's, I mean, yeah, like, I think that's a normal response. Like, I think that's just, you know, like, I'm, I'm just very conflicted, right? Okay, so uh, Mary, again, like, she denied the claims. She said that um you know she started crying she uh she sustained that she had no part in the killing of martin brown uh yes her and norma did go to martin's house and requested to see his body oh sorry not Mar yeah to see his body but uh you know according to mary it was only because they were uh quote daring each, each other and one of us did not want to be a chicken um mary went on to accuse norma of orchestrating and committing both murders and Norma was the one who you know like Mary said like Norma was the one who tr strangled Brown uh, blah. <laughs> yes I can't speak Norma was the one who strangled Brian Howe and uh, as Mary was the one witnessing the scene in horror so she was just kind of flipping the roles right like what Norma said was that Mary was 
who was the perpetrator and she was the one observing but mary said like no it was the other way around uh she said she didn't tell the police because she was so just so scared of norma and also still you know but also still loyal to her to her as a friend so she didn't want to like sell her out that however did not line up with uh, the witness statements because norma's mother catherine uh recalled that one time several months prior to the murders uh, she and her husband walked in on Mary trying to strangle Norma's younger sister, Susan. Mind you, Mary didn't stop uh, when they walk in, walked in. She only stopped when Norma's father punched her in the shoulder and pulled her off of Susan. So she would have killed Susan. Uh, she just didn't because the, the adults walked in and stopped her. Like, physically stopped her. So the trial took nine days and on december 17th uh, the jury retired to you know like the decide on the verdict and it took only three hours and 25 minutes for them to announce that mary was a dangerous individual and she was absolutely a danger to other children uh despite that because it doesn't get better despite that they found mary guilty not of murder but of manslaughter of both boys what the fuck who knows? Mysterious ways. Um, I guess court just worked in mysterious ways. Um, so she was sentenced to be uh, imprisoned at Her Majesty's pleasure. Um, and I'm gonna explain what that means. This essentially means the indefinite imprisonment until Her Majesty the Queen or, you know, like the, the reigning monarch uh, decided otherwise. So there wasn't a term, you know, right? Like there wasn't an... A, period of time and during which she's gonna be imprisoned it was at her majesty's pleasure meaning she's gonna be in prison until or i mean she's gonna be uh isolated until the queen says otherwise uh norma was acquitted of all charges because she was just a you know an accessory to the, well i mean accessory kind of like she was just a witness she was just kind of you know just witness the the thing she just was too scared to say anything and Again, you would think this is the end of that story. Mary ended up in prison and spent her rest, the rest of her life in confinement, uh, in confinement away from society. I wish that was the case, but it's not. It's not the case. This is not the end. So sit your ass down. Don't go anywhere. You're, you know, you're locked into the stream. You can't leave. Also, because this is not the end. The story goes on. Uh, so Mary spent. 12 years in detention um in re uh, like remand home i don't i'm not sure if i'm pronouncing it uh correctly but uh the the you know like the um, the house well i mean yes yeah, like juvies kind of like juvenile prison sort of uh and then young offenders institution uh where she was the only female among 24 inmates uh, a year into her sentence at the institution, she claimed that she was sexually abused by a member of staff and other inmates. Uh, which, I mean, it was never really, like, proven, like, you know, true. Uh, later, at the age of 16, I mean, maybe, who knows? Like, I don't, I don't see any, I didn't see, like, any, like, real proof that it was true or, like, untrue. Uh, so later at the age, the age of 16, uh, Mary was transferred to a secure wing of HM uh, prison style in Cheshire. Uh, she applied for parole during the, her stay there, but she was denied. Then in 1976, uh, Mary got transferred again uh, to Moon Court Open Prison, which is the open prison is the type of prison with minimal supervision and perimeter security. And prisoners can get permission to take up employment uh, during their sentence. Is that a good idea? I oh, don't know. Did she, did she kind of, you know, rehabilitate herself? Was she not a psycho anymore? She was. She still was. Uh, but she was placed. I guess they thought like, oh, it's fine. You know, she's not gonna uh, do anything, and and it's fine if she has minimal supervision. Great idea. Um, <laughs> which is clear yeah okay so initially oh no she did <laughs> so initially she did behave well and she even took up a uh job as a secretary 
However, 15 months into her stay at this open prison in September 1977, Mary and her fellow inmate Annette Priest made headlines when they attempted to escape the, escape the facility and spent several days with two unidentified men in a seaside resort town of Blackpool. Uh, they were partying, they were going to hotels, and they were having the time of their life. Um, so many, Mary soon was uh, arrested again and on September 13th. Uh, by this point, she had already dyed her hair blonde. Uh, probably, like, I mean, likely in an effort to disguise her identity and likely to run off and live in hiding. Uh, her accomplice, Annette Priest, was arrested the following day and the two were returned to prison. Uh, so Belle's punishment for the escape was ridiculously light uh, because she just lost her prison privileges for like 28 days. Ooh, so strict, right? I don't, I don't understand. Like, why was she in that? in that prison to begin with like why not a higher security prison like she is trying to escape god damn it all right so um yeah so she was given just like 29 days of just yeah you know like losing prison privileges oh so scary uh but it still gets worse oh yeah it gets worse oh yeah it, it, it absolutely gets worse uh <laughs> I mean, what can I tell you? I just, I wish I could tell you it gets better and she spent the rest of her life in prison. She didn't. Um, so Mary Bell was released from prison in May 1980 at the age of 23, which is essentially the beginning of her life. She's just starting her life. Uh, she served most, almost 11 and a half years in custody. Upon her release, she was granted anonymity, full anonymity and a change of name which means she could now start her life as a new person under a new identity somewhere far from her hometown where no one knows her, no one knows who she is, no one knows what she's done. Um, and, and yeah, also uh, they granted anonymity to her daughter and her granddaughter, like lifetime anonymity, which awesome. This is a great plan, good plan. Um, her spokesperson said, quote, she wishes to be given a chance to live a normal life and to be left alone. Which again, like, oh, in the, you know, in the light of everything that she's gone through as a child, as in before the murders, yeah, I feel bad for her. On the other hand, what she, you know, like this shaped her in a way that she, that rendered her da dangerous to society, uh, well, at least small children, uh, who knows, in adulthood, but as a child, as a child, she was a danger to other children, like now, like serious danger, and now she's an adult. Does that, does that mean, I don't know, I'm gonna talk about it, but like, does that mean she's not a danger anymore? <laughs> okay, so it is known that four years after her release, Mary Bell gave birth uh, to a daughter, and Mary's new family had no idea about her, you know, about her well, her daughter didn't know about her past i don't know if actually she had a partner or not or she was a single mom um uh, but they you know like the daughter didn't know about her past uh, but in 1988 some reporters tracked her down in a town on uh sussex on the sussex coast uh which subsequently forced mary and her daughter which who was there then 14 uh to relocate to a safe house with undercover officers and then they relocated again uh, to an undisclosed location, and I think they changed their names again. So it is known that Mary Bell had a granddaughter. Let's continue the line lineage, I guess. Uh, who, just like Mary and her daughter, is, you know, again, she's covered by the lifelong right to anonymity. And the only thing known about the granddaughter is that she was referred to as uh, Z or Z. Uh, so maybe her first name just starts with Z or something. Um, okay, then in 1998, Mary Bell released... <sighs> I forgot about this. But, uh, so in 1998, Mary Bell released her autobi autobiography. Uh, she was in, in collaboration with this author, uh, Gitta Therini. Uh, the autobiography was uh, titled Cries Under Unheard, The Story of Mary Bell. 
what is it with like serial killers just publishing a book like books like uh, right and left and just like or killers i don't see i don't like that um but anyway so she releases her autobiography titled cries unheard the story of mary bell uh in which she recounted the abuse she endured uh, during her childhood from her mother and several of her clients uh at present mary's new name and her whereabouts are unknown yes she is out there uh, she is alive uh, she allegedly does not deny her past crimes and despite what was in her book uh, according to the author to the author that collaborated on this book mary does not excuse her actions with the abuse she suffered as a child uh, so I guess, but is it true that she, well, it's not true that she feels bad about it. It's, it's just not because she does have psychopathic personality disorder, which means she does not have empathy. So saying that, you know, even if she claims like, oh, I feel so bad about it. She doesn't like just physically cannot like that. She's incapable to, you know, of feeling bad about it. She can just say like, okay, well, I mean, I recognize because they told me it's wrong. I recognize it's wrong. That's it. Uh, by the way, there's also one more thing that I wanted to show you guys because though I wasn't like sure where to uh, put it in the case, uh, at which point did it fit in the story because I'm not sure how they discovered it. I couldn't find it, but uh, it was uh, probably like a piece of evidence in Mary's trial. Uh, here, here is her uh, like a, an entry to her diary in her diary with a drawing depicting the murder of Martin Brown. So this says toddler, by the way, and that's her. And then there's the toddler. So yeah, yeah, that's that, that's that's it. <sighs> yeah, that's that's kind of scary. OK, so I think the last thing that I wanted to talk about, the one thing that I and I'm sure like many, many people, many of you guys wonder about is whether or not Mary Bell was ever able to integrate into society and live a normal life because clinically diagnosed psychopathic personality disorder isn't curable. There isn't a cure. There's no cure for this. Um, it can't like, I don't think it's like even treatable. Like it can hardly even hardly like be called treatable. There isn't a pill that can instill empathy because that's what the, that's the emotion, the core trait that is missing in psychopaths. Uh, the treatment, quote unquote, like treatment for this condition is essentially tr teaching, um, you know, patients to play a game of pretend for the rest of their lives. Like, play pretend that you have emotions and you have empathy, right? Um, but otherwise, like, there's no treatment. Uh, there is no, they don't respond, like apparently, you know, psychopaths, they don't respond to group therapy. They don't respond to uh, psychoanalysis. They don't respond to like individual therapy. There is no pill again and and yeah like they can only like play pretend and just not go batshit crazy uh which leads me to the question did mary bell live her life without hurting anyone else after her release or did she just get better at getting rid of the evidence and hiding her crimes officially she's living a normal life unofficially who knows also, by the way, in uh, kind of to stay on theme and like, oh, in the kind of in the light of discussing the uh, psychopathic personality disorder, I highly recommend that you guys watch like you don't have to watch the whole season of New Amsterdam. You don't have to watch that. Um, but there is an episode in the show New Amsterdam with a little girl uh, who is diagnosed later in the episode with psychopathic personality disorder and she's actually like hurting her brother like she is like choking him and holy shit this actress the, this little actress a fucking genius because you watch this episode and you're fucking scared of her it's so good like the way she acted it's so and apparently and apparently she acted very like the you know critics say like oh this was this is exactly like that like children with this you know personality disorder that's how they act and it just it was just super like i don't know um but yeah like very good episode like you guys if you're if you're curious to see like what it is like how it how a child like that would behave i highly recommend that you watch that episode like it was it was pretty chilling 
uh, what episode and what season? Uh, I think it was season one or wait, let me let me see, let me see, let me see. Amsterdam. Uh, let me see. Which was it? Uh. I forgot which episode was it, but um, but yeah, like if you, if you, I think episode, sorry, episode, uh, sorry, season two, episode five, yeah, season two, episode five, that's the, yeah, that's the one. Uh, also, Jose, thank you so much for the super. That's the million dollar question, Sona. It is. It really is, and yeah. Uh, at this point, she would be in like her 70s, so probably not doing much strangling, but um, still potentially dangerous. Absolutely. Also, I mean, I wouldn't want this to happen, but I, after reading this case, after like just, you know, writing notes on this case and researching it, my one of my thoughts, like, you know, my thought was that, who knows, maybe in 10 years we're gonna see a Netflix documentary about a killer grandma that had dark past. Well, because she could have gotten better at hiding the evidence. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I hope she just, you know, is living a normal life and she doesn't, she's not violent anymore. But who the fuck knows? Uh, yeah, season two, episode five. You guys highly recommend it. Uh, watch that episode because the the little girl just, yeah, yeah. I mean, the actress is really good at what she's doing, but you know, just just saying. Or maybe she wasn't acting. Who the fuck knows? Um, we may never know exactly. Hopefully she got help. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully she got help. Um, and she's just living quietly and she's just like, you know, just living her life and, and never hurt anyone else. But yeah, you know, that's the, that is the million dollar question. Uh, oh, both of them, Martin and Brian, I hope they are resting in peace. Uh, Sana, just so you know, I had a dream of a girl named Mary Bella. What the fuck? Before I knew you were doing this stream. Why, Queen? Why? Why do you have, like, premonitions and prof prophetic dreams? Why? Jeez. That's why I prefer to be in a town city with a neighborhood that's really safe. I'm not from a... Uh, I'm from a city in my birth state. Yeah, like... I mean... Yeah. On one hand... Oh, okay, on one hand... If you live in a small town, like, oh, it's generally more, like, safe or something. But on the other hand, any Netflix documentary starts with, it was such a quiet small town and a tight-knit community. Nothing ever happens here. <laughs> no one expected something like this to happen, and it did. And it's just like, yeah, because this is like a cookie-cutter serial killer town. Um, but yeah, you know. Uh, hope you guys are safe. Uh, you know, I'm sorry. I hope I didn't scare you too much. I didn't like scar you for life with this story. Uh, I scarred myself for life with this story because, duh, because uh, it was crazy. It was crazy until it did. Exactly, exactly. I feel safe and secure. So not you're not safe. Let me tell you why. <laughs> Here, sit down. Sit down. Let me tell you a story. Let me tell you why. Why that's wrong. Um, a member for 14 months, Kronos, thank you so much. 14 months down, many more to go. Hey, hey, glow sticks. Uh, I feel like the smaller the town, the more crime. I feel like, I feel like it's just, it's just such a classic thing. Like, yeah, in the big city, there's more dangerous, let's say, because there's more people. So there's like, oh, you know, the statistics are like, statistically, it's higher possibility that, you know, there's, there's more crime or something, but I don't know. I don't know, like, not that many documentaries that I watched, like, true crime documentaries that I watched that were, like, in in huge city. Like, a couple of them, yeah. Several of them, yeah. But, like, somehow, somehow, it's like, oh, this, like, small, tight-knit community and this unsolved crime happened and no one knows. No one I will ever know. <sighs> ah. All right. I just need to worry about the ticks. Yeah. Just just worry about the Lone Star ticks. Just be be careful. Lone Star ticks are vicious motherfuckers, um, and also they car they carry Lyme disease. So, yeah, and also possibly like radioactive. They are like radioactive. So just just so you know, uh, I got fifty percent scarred and ten percent not scarred. 
scared scared sorry I, I was i was talking about scarred uh not scared and now i'm scared of leaving my future kids by them by themselves because i don't want them taken away from me so soon what i mean yeah the obviously obviously be careful out there like you know just uh take care of your kids um observe i i think the scary i think i'm scared like what if my future kid turns out to be you know diagnosed with psychopathic personality i don't know see like psychopathic personality disorder it's difficult to because on one hand on one hand it is your child you want to take care of them on the other hand like they quite literally a lot of them you know they they have to be kind of in a facility for sort of for like a long time until they learn how to live in society so they are unable incapable of feeling empathy they're incapable of like feeling you know empathy or, or like strong emotions or love so yeah like you can never really believe them <laughs> i i think i would be very like i would be very conflicted about my child being a like diagnosed psychopath i would be incredibly conflicted like the i does that make me a bad person i don't know like maybe but i would be super conflicted you know what to do uh, Sona's kid is just gonna be another Sona. She's gonna be talking about true crime at the age of three. <laughs> Probably. I mean, no, I wouldn't do this. Like, I would. I mean, I would. I yeah, no. Look, okay, 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 okay. I can, I can tell, I can tell you guys now that uh, you know when my child, like maybe not when they are small, but like oh, when they are a teenager, when they enter their puberty age and like teenage years. And they say like they start complaining saying like mom i want to go to this party can you like this you know I, I like can you let me go to this party with these people that we don't know or something and i'll be like okay sit your ass down let me show you a true crime documentary and then you can decide you know just just so you know this happens i'm probably like every every life lesson that i'm gonna teach them is gonna be like sit your ass down let's play this tr netflix true crime documentary <laughs> It's like let the documentary speak for me that's that's my that's my parenting style <clears throat> yeah and you know uh future stream the case of murders on the journey no i mean i hope not jesus i hope i hope my child is not gonna be turned out to be a serial killer although like if i you know because i was saying like at one point I, I was saying like oh if the child like ever misbehaved or well not misbehaved but like oh it's behave like those demon children like oh spat in my face or like you know like even one if even once i would be like off you go to a military school and and my friend was just like my, my friend was saying like this is how you raise serial killers like <laughs> they're gonna come back <laughs> they're gonna come back to get you no like i'm i hope i you see like this is the that's the difficulty of like imagining yourself as a parent and like i have no idea if i if i could do this no idea if i could be a parent um because one i'm scared of everything so like if my child like i know that my niece started drawing some like weird things as in like ghost things like oh seeing like dark figure in like my sister said like oh on one like one time one occasion like my niece said like oh there's someone in the room and it's like oh she said like it's a shadow or something and i'm like yep does it i would just i would start drawing circles with salt and holy water because that's it that does that uh <clears throat> um angel hi also baxter thank you so much for for the super someone draw her future mothman baby fan art <laughs> oh no kids are a roll of dice in terms of personality it seems yeah they are they are like i mean i hope i hope it you know i would do a good job as a parent am i sure no i'm not i'm not i feel like i would just i don't know i have no idea i would just like to put them in a straight jacket that's it and like <laughs> make them sit there <laughs> oh god uh jose thank you they will be fine probably you'll be a good mama am i will i i don't know see that's uh, every day it stresses me out like if, to think about it to think about the future and be like um, is this can I, would i be able to do this like especially seeing those cases holy shit seeing those cases i'm just like would i ever be able to do this because like i don't know if i could be like i, I could handle this um no one is really ready for being a parent that's true that is true well i'm uh, i'm not yet so hey and uh you said you're afraid of kids can you handle a child of your own 
Yeah, I would I would just carry like a pouch with like salt and then a bottle of holy water like at all times and just like a spray bottle of holy water. <laughs> and whenever whenever my child just like sees something or says or draws something weird, I'll be like, psh, psh, psh. no, <laughs> bad. <laughs> like stop it. Oh, shy shy, let's all. Let baby Sona rule the world. Bless. <laughs> shai Shai, thank you for the super. Uh, <laughs> holy salt. Exactly. I would just like <laughs> throw throw salt at them. <laughs> throw salt at them and also like spray them with the with the holy water in a spray bottle. <laughs> just like <laughs> uh, Sona out there preparing to bless her child whenever they make um, a new imaginary friend. Yeah. I would just beg. Like, Honey, it's okay for you to have an imaginary friend, but just in case, let's check if your imaginary friend is a good imaginary friend or if they're gonna perish in hellfire if I spray them with holy water. <laughs> let's just make sure. <laughs> oh my god, okay. Oh my god. <clears throat> you can only do your best. Make the effort and give the kid love. Exactly. Like, I mean, I hope you know what you know what you know what like that's i was actually we were like i was talking about it we were talking about it like with my friend um you know like oh about about like oh future children right like future just like oh you know what it would be like to be a parent and what i told her was that hey i i just hope um i just hope i'm gonna be the kind of parent uh that my kid can trust with uh i don't know if you've seen this like stand up by by dave Chappelle, but basically um i would like to be the type of parent that my kid can call if they are at a fucking party they are shit faced and they know they shouldn't be driving and they know they're not scared to call me and be like okay mom it's i know it's 3 a.m but you told me not to drive if i'm shit faced well i am shit faced can you pick me can you please pick me up and i'll be like <laughs> motherfucker i'm at the same party <laughs> You will not believe this. I'm on the same party. <laughs> also, Lance, thank you so much. Did you yeet your niece after they drew? No, I didn't. But because I was only because I was in a different country at the time. <laughs> this is like if you if you saw that stand up, like this is what he said. It's like, it's like, motherfucker, you will not believe this. I'm at the same party. <laughs> no, okay, okay, okay. I would just, you know what, like, I would, I would just really hope that my child, like, if they get in trouble, if they get, like, yeah, if they get shit-faced drunk and, you know, like, they wanna come back safely home, uh, they would not be afraid to call me or, like, oh, if they got into a car accident and they were fine, uh, but they were, like, th that they wouldn't be afraid to call me and be like, hey, mom, this is hap this happened, like, can you, you know, like, please, I need your help, I'm like, okay, okay, you're in trouble, and I'm gonna whoop your ass, but... You know, I'm gonna come for you. <laughs> this is, okay, in my in my dictionary, whooping ass is like sitting them down and like telling them to like, I don't know, read Norwegian dictionary for like six hours. Um, <clears throat> Dave's relaxation would be weed. <laughs> Sona's relaxation would be wine. <laughs> so you would eat your knees? Well, I mean, no, but, but maybe. <laughs> I would consider the option. <laughs> <laughs> Sona is now out here partying, then maybe letting their kid go to the same party. Party Sona. No, I just I was just I was just channeling Dave Chappelle. But um but yeah, like it was uh, you know, like it was a fun stand-up. Uh I think I think like the, the gist of it is the same. So like I would like to be the parent that um, you know, I know like my kid knows that hey, they can call me if they are really in trouble. They're gonna be in trouble with me. Don't get me wrong, like they're still gonna they're still gonna get their ass whooped now. <laughs> no okay joke joke um they're you know i'm still gonna be disappointed in them but well not with the car accident maybe but like with the with the party probably not like if they were safe they just got drunk and they were responsible like you know they didn't want to drive and you know they they made sure that hey you know i'm not driving drunk and then yeah i wouldn't be i wouldn't be disappointed i would be like okay well you know good decision thanks for calling me i'm gonna get you Am I happy about getting to the, the party at 3 a.m.? No, I'm not, because I was sleeping, but... <laughs> no, I'm not! I'm not, I was just kidding. I was just literally kidding. 
Uh, but yeah, you know, like I would, I would still, I would still pick up, pick up my kid. Like I would actually be a little bit proud that hey, they, you know, they listened to what I said, what I told them, and they didn't, uh, didn't like drunk drive, and you know, that would make me a little bit proud. Cause like, okay, you're responsible. You're not stupid. Uh, be a good mom. <laughs> Sona Junior, mom, did you check under the bed for monsters, Sona? Of course, but there's. Here's 50 other, thing, other things you should be afraid of. <laughs> I mean, like, this is not, this is the least of your worries. Um, you would be a good mother, Zona. Hey! <laughs> would I? I don't know, I have no idea. Um, I'd rather you be safe than you be, be hurt. Exactly, exactly. Like, I, I think I would be, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's the gist of it. Like, I would rather that my kid is safe and responsible than then you know like me worried like i wouldn't i wouldn't tell them like no you can't go to this party uh unless it's like super suspicious no never mind like i would i would probably like i wouldn't tell them like hey you can't go to this party i would just tell them come here to the living room sit your ass down let me show you show you this netflix true crime documentary about this girl who went to a party and what happened and then they'd be like, she never returned. <laughs> like, yes, exactly. She disappeared in mysterious circumstances. Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh my god, okay. I'm probably gonna go gonna adopt. <laughs> I mean that's I mean that's good for you, you know? I mean any option. I think I think either, you know, if that's how you feel, all power to you. If you if you want to have your like if you want to have biological children, all power to you. If you want to adopt children, all power to you. I think it's you know it's kind of individual choice. It is uh, you know it, it, I think it's pretty noble to um, like if you're adopting for the right reasons. Obviously, if you like genuinely want a child and you know and and you want to have like you want to adopt a child because there's a lot of children out there who don't have families they are in the foster care which is not ideal and obviously they're waiting for their home um so yeah you know like if you genuinely want a family this is that you're not adopting for like i don't know like because people also adopt for the wrong reasons right they're not fit to be uh, like half kids <sighs> or you know like they're not the best people because those those cases happened of the wrong people adopting children and just ending in tragedy but um you know i think i think it's uh i think it's also a good thing because there's a lot of kids out there who who need home um <laughs> how did we get into parenting stuff i mean that's you know the whole case is about a, a, ser a 10 year old serial killer 11 year old serial killer so uh I'd rather adopt. My genes are horrible. That's a valid, you know, like, that's a valid point. Like, that's a valid reason, too. Like, if you know that, hey, you know, there's, there are, um, like, pretty bad, like, genetic disorders running in the family or, like, something else that you know that, oh, you know, it's, I'm um, high risk and I would, I would pass it to my child. There are, you know, that's, that's a valid reason to, like, not have kids, too, as in not have biological kids. Um, I think, I think it's also pretty responsible. Like, you know, if you really consider, hey, like, there's this, um there's the thing there's this thing this genetic disorder that runs in my family and i don't want to pass it to my kid or or something else like yeah that's absolutely a valid reason um uh i forgot that i was originally going to write hey dorothy thank you so much for the super uh but yeah you know like i th i think it's uh i think it's okay right like i think i think the it's a valid reason there's like many reasons for wanting to adopt instead of having biological children that's an individual thing I think. Uh, okay, here's a story about a killer maniac. They never found him because it was me. What? Then why did you give your? Why did you give? Why? Why? You just you just exposed you exposed yourself. What? I think I might adopt just because my mom cursed me with the. I hope you have one just like you. No one needs another big slim in this world. <laughs> See, I don't know. Like I'm I'm still kind of. I'm, I, I guess like I'm unsure, but I, I would be okay with either. Like, you know, having biological children or, or adopting. I think I would be okay with either. So, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see where <laughs> where life gets me. Either way, they are watching a lot of true crime documentaries as a life lesson. Uh, <clears throat> I can't have kids because of something called the ugly- What? <laughs> what? <laughs> okay then? 
Uh, Queen, also, thank you so much for being a member for six months. Woo, six months already? A hey, celebration. Celebration. Uh, also, if George the werewolf was real and I finally see him, I would be so happy and he would maybe follow me around and... So what? Okay. I just want to adopt to get a child out of the orphanage. Um, yeah, like, you know, I think... I think, as I said, as I said, there is... Uh, I think there's a lot of kids in the system and the system is not great in any country because uh, I know in Poland it's not great. Uh, there's a lot of kids that are, you know, without parents and and yeah like if you you know if you're financially able to uh if you are ready if you're if you know that you're ready to be a parent because you are their parent it doesn't matter if they are your bi biological children or not the moment you adopt them yeah they are your children um if you are a responsible adult and you have the means to raise a child then obviously you know that is your choice and i would probably adopt a kid yeah i mean you know Again, like I'm I'm glad that it's not you know like I'm glad that it's it's an option and you know people like people have options right like you can you can decide for yourself it's not like I, I really hate the pressure from society um, like from I really hate the pressure like I always hated the pressure it's not like like previously I thought I didn't want biological children uh, like this is my this is just my reason okay like that's just my take on it and uh, obviously I'm not like saying oh everyone should have biological children or, or not have children it's up to you it's really up to you but like my I what I always hated was like my family um, you know my mom or like my you know my family just kind of pressing me just saying like oh when are you having kids when are you having kids and I would be like oh I don't know if I want to you know if I want to have a biological kid or if I want if I want to adopt and they would be like oh don't adopt like you know like oh but you know you have to oh it's not yours then it's just like no it still would be mine it, you know the moment I adopt them I'm their parent uh, also I really really hated when my mom would like say oh you know kind of press me to to have kids soon or something it's just like dude no like as in like oh I don't want to be forced like when you tell me like I don't want to be forced into that like, I want it to be my decision. Hello. Uh, society, make child not right? Like, it's just like, like years ago, years ago, I was just like, oh, I, I don't know. Like, I just, I was only in university or something and my mom was already asking. I'm like, dude, <laughs> like, can I like at least start my life? Can I at least like have a career? Can you like give me, would you be so kind to give me some time to think if I want a you know, bio biological child or would I want to adopt? And she's like, no, but yours. And it's like, that makes no sense. Um, Les, thank you so much. People putting the pressure on makes you almost not want to do it. Exactly. Like this is this is it. That's it. Like, oh, people, if if let's say if my mom the same the same way, like, oh, the same thing, but just like the other way. If my family was telling me, like pressuring me to like adopt a child, I would also not want to. Because I would be like, okay, you're forcing me into it. I'm not ready for that or something. And it's just like, wait. Uh, some people are just not so about that. For example, my mother has unironically said C-section is not as valid as na <laughs> not as valid as natural birth. That's fucking crazy. That's that's insane. That's crazy. Ah, Sona's family is so traditional. No, it was mostly it was more like well, my mom is a midwife actually. My mom is a nurse slash midwife. Uh, well, not that it matters, but, uh, you know, like she, I guess like she, cause she all, like all the time she deals with, uh, you know, like she works with pregnant women and she works with like babies, right? Like she's in the deliveries. Uh, I, I think she had like, at one point she had like constant, like grand, grand baby fever. <laughs> like luckily, luckily I have an older sister. So this was not an issue. <laughs> my sister had a child first. <laughs> there was my niece. Uh, but, you know, like, so the pressure is off, uh, but, but yeah, you know, like the, you know, my mom, my mom is a midwife and then like my grandparents are pretty, you know, they are in their eighties. So they are like pretty traditional and, and, you know, like, yeah, like they still have, it's a different generation, right? So they still have like different mindset, um, which is crazy, which is also crazy. Like they would kind of. Like, I love them to death, but at the same time, it's just like, I understand that their mindset is just different. Like, the, it's, it, it is a generational thing uh, that they would insist on, like, bio children, even though, like, my literally my grandfather was adopted. Like, my grandfather is 
is an adopted child. Uh, does your mom smoke in her breaks? Oh yeah, absolutely. She smokes like a chimney. I that's why I never like both my mom and like my father. They, well, I don't know about my father now, but uh, but yeah, my mom still smokes. Uh, they smoked like chimneys when I was a kid, which made me hate smoking so much, so much. Like I hated so much. I never tried it. I actually like my motion sickness. I got it from my father smoking in the fucking car, which thanks dad might get a, I don't know, cancer later on. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Second hand smoking. Um, but it was again, like it was a different time. So they like my father just smoked in the car. Father of the year. Uh, <laughs> Sona is waiting for the perfect mo perfect moth to settle down. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's how it is. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, like cigarette smoke made me sick as a child. And I think that's how my motion sickness started. Like now if I'm in a car, uh, well, it's it's much better now because like I, you know, like I don't smoke uh, and no one, no one in my, like my friend group or, or anything like they don't smoke and like my family now, they also know not to smoke around me or like around my sister or anything. So they don't do this. Uh, but yeah, like I would get nauseous. So that's how it started. Origin. Motion sickness. Uh, Sona is looking for a decent moth dad to settle down with like a little... With her little feelings, yeah. <laughs> uh, taking Dramamine, Dramamine helps with the motion sickness. Oh, see, I didn't know that. But, uh, like, I took, you know, I would take motion sickness medicine or, like, um, ginger, and it's fine. Like, no, it's fine. No, it's much better. But it was, it was pretty bad, like, as a child. Um, I know what it's like to be adopted and be in foster care, even though I don't really remember it. The foster system I don't remember, but the adoption I remember vaguely. I see, I see. So you have you have first um, like first hand experience, right? Like I mean, I know it's not ideal. Um, it isn't ideal. Like it isn't ideal in Poland. I don't know how it is in the states. I did hear some like pretty bad opinions uh, regarding the foster care system and like adoption system, like just it's. Like, I mean, this, this is what I heard. Like, obviously, I never lived in the States, so I don't know. Um, I can only speak for, like, Poland. It's not it's not ideal. It's not great. Uh, because, yeah, there is a lot, of, a lot more children than there is adults willing to adopt. Uh, or foster, like, licensed kind of professional. Well, I mean, what is it? Like, what is it called? Like, I guess professional foster families. Um... So yeah, it's, you know, it is what it is. I wish it would change. I wish it would improve. I wish more people would adopt too. Uh, more responsible people would adopt. <coughs> um, but yeah, you know, that's, I think that's on an individual level. Uh, and my mom is trying her best to stop smoking and she's almost at four of uh, stop smoking, stop to smoke and uh, I can't stand the smell because yeah I, I feel that I feel that it's I can't stand I, to this day I'm just like repulsed uh, by the smell so yeah I, I just get away if someone is smoking I'm just gonna like get away <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I want to make my own choice in adoption it's always it also always has to be right like it can't be forced because like then it wasn't your choice right <laughs> you have to you know this is again this has to be your personal individual choice and you have to feel ready and you have to be like okay yeah i want to i want to do this you know like i want i'm ready for this i'm ready to take responsibility um i'm actually hoping to adopt nice uh a kid when i grow older yeah and best of luck to your mom melissa hey best of luck to to melissa's mom hope she quits smoking yeah i i lost hope for my mom like she just gave up <laughs> she just she was like yeah i don't give a shit anymore Oh, great this is great this is awesome although she doesn't smoke as much as she did she used to because she used to smoke more i think now it's like it's a little bit more social so like with other people but like sometimes yeah like she doesn't smoke as much as she did so i'm just like okay whatever uh <laughs> so that will be the father <laughs> sure <laughs> so when sona has kids would they be angry uh moblets <laughs> what are feelings <laughs> These are the things they keep me up, that keep me up at night. <clears throat> I think we have to think about it. 
you have to think about a name for what do we if i have a child what do we name them <laughs> moth i don't know mothlings <laughs> fearling fearling Fear, yeah a fearling a fearling or feelings uh sure why not <clears throat> but yeah uh you guys this was a, a pleasure uh even though it was also a scary story and a scary case and just like horrible 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 horrifying case uh <laughs> team fearling hey mini moths <laughs> mini sonas <clears throat> I'm sorry, my, my throat is already, my voice is just going meh. Uh, but you guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for chatting. Uh, I appreciate all the supas and all the memberships. Uh, super generous. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. Uh, again, special thanks to... Yes, I can't speak. Uh, special thanks to my Patreon members. Uh, because you guys continuously support the channel and i hope that you enjoy the bonus streams i hope that you enjoy all the uh, additional content uh, i appreciate every single one of you i appreciate the the ones who uh, joined higher tiers to to you know also hang out with me uh, every month and <clears throat> yeah i think that's it that's it that's that oh i did i did show the new design like kind of working on the new design i showed it i showed the sketch in the in my last patreon stream so if you're curious to see uh the you know the rough kind of sketch of the new upcoming design you can uh it's very very different very different i will you know, i don't know transform metamorphosis uh i'm like a transformer but yeah, if you're curious, you can see it in the... You can watch the, the, the last stream, the Full Body Chill stream, and you can see it. Um, but that's that's it. That's it. Thank you so much. Uh, I enjoy being here. Hey! Heather, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm glad to hear that you enjoyed the stream. Um, I hope to see you again. And even though I was uh, late, glad to make to your make it to your stream. Hey, Coffee Obsession, thank you so much. I love your username, by the way. I agree. <laughs> 100% true. Coffee Obsession. <laughs> Uh, but thank you so much, so, so very much, and I'm glad to hear that you guys enjoyed the stream, and yeah, I'm glad to see you here every time I stream. Okay, uh, it's Transformers, so not in disguise, yeah, I'm, I'm like Bumblebee. Uh, also, mind you, just, this is like the last comment, the last comment regarding, uh, you know, me having a child. I would tell like, my child, when they are an infant, when they are a baby and a toddler, they with their clothes would be would only be like like chubs costumes like a bumblebee or a seal or a pumpkin they would just be wearing that every fucking day the little baby would just be little baby sona would just be wearing uh you know round costumes <laughs> this is the only one the only ones is that they would possess are the the round like chubs costumes because <laughs> super fucking cute uh, bumblebee <laughs> they would just have bumblebee costumes that's that's it <clears throat> every day for any occasion doesn't matter if it's halloween or not it's every single day they would just wear a, a bumblebee costume <laughs> or yeah or like a little mothman costume that too that too absolutely 100 percent. like i'm i am i'm gonna be preparing like when i decide to have to have kids like i'm gonna be preparing to i should start buying chubs costumes okay you guys you guys thank you so much again um <laughs> stay safe out there always look at your i'm gonna have like so many embarrassing pictures of my child not make no mistake also when they grow up like you know to a teenage like teenage years also make no mistake if i ever drive a car i'm gonna I drive my kid to school i'm gonna have this like speaker this like megaphone speaker and like you know, I'll drive them to school, they leave the car, they don't say I love you, I say I love you, and they don't say it back. They exit the car, it's gonna be like a scene from Spider-Verse. I'm gonna just like, like the, like the dad, I'm just like, I love you, son. You didn't say I love you back. <laughs> just gonna embarrass them. <laughs> ah, and I'm gonna film everything. <clears throat> I wanna, I want this to happen. This is my plan. Okay, you guys, thank you so much. Uh, again, stay safe out there. Always lock your doors and windows. Bear your hexes. Until the next time, I'll see you guys uh, on Wednesday. So, bye. See ya.
sorry, I was drinking water. Uh, but Fabian, thank you so much for the super. Come forth, young Bassona. Let the fear mother. What? Let the fear mother you. Oh no. <laughs> oh no, why? Why? Also, also, mind you, okay, okay. Fun fact researchers at the University of Tokyo found that although pet cats can recognize their owner's voice, the felines usually choose to ignore their calls. So cats are assholes. As per usual, they just ignore you. They hear you. They can recognize their name. They hear your ca you calling them. They just ignore it. They don't, you know, they don't uh, submit to those sorts of demands. So that's, that's it. Hey. Okay, thank you so much, you guys. I'll see you next time.